So this is Heidi from Italy, from the wisdomfactory.net. And in Conversations That Matter, I talk today with Dorothy Stern Kutcher. And we want to talk about the red energy experiences we are living or having or whatever. With red, we need, mean the stage of development as in spiral dynamics or also in the levels of development of Ken Wilber. That means the third stage of development where life is dominated by ecocentrism and everything for me. And we develop a huge uh, power of going out into the world and doing everything for me, which is uh, sort of good in many ways, but also leads to much problems as it has been in the past with leading to, to wars of all kinds, to bloodshed and whatever, because it's only about me. And the other people are sort of a, uh, uh, how can you call that? It's, they, they are an extension of ourselves to, to, to pump out what we need. So in the, this stage of development, we cannot really yet see the other person as somebody who has needs to, and which we might need to respect to have a, a good relationship with them. And unfortunately, many people still are living in this mindset also, sometimes from outside, it doesn't seem like this, but then happen things and <laughs> you realize, oh, mm, okay, that was red energy. <laughs> so that's my introduction to it. Uh, Dorothy, would you like to, to give your version? Um, Heidi, you, it still says Bill Kucha. I know last time you fixed it because we're both doing Zoom now. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I haven't studied Ken Wilber, and when you said you uh, had an experience of red energy, uh, I imagined uh, what you meant was something strong in terms of one ego protecting itself and, and attacking uh, you. And because, and so I thought it was you know a, a personal thing that had happened an experience. And um, I'm dealing with uh, my own ego and the needs of my ego and how or what my ego thinks I need and how that's such a trap in terms of, as you said, uh, being able to step into the shoes uh, and listen um, to what the other person might tr be trying to communicate but in a harsh and angry and, and frightened way. And it seems like the tension in this state of development that I think most of human beings are in. <laughs> I, I think some of us are, are looking ahead and, and trying to move and are moving slowly uh, in, a, in a direction beyond it. But I think the essential nature of humanness at this point is still that. And so I was interested in sharing with you, Heidi, and hearing, you know, how, how we can in our own lives and with our own limitations, uh, make some very small baby steps uh, toward opening and allowing the grip of the ego to, to release itself so that we can proceed with more compassion, more empathy, uh, and more strength uh, when that red energy, see, I thought of it as red energy, which is burning hot, you know, when some, I feel like I'm being burned up, um, really destroyed, my, my heart is being destroyed, my needs are not being listened to, I have no hope of getting them met, in this situation and how we pioneers, if I can be so arrogant as to say that, you know, how, what works for each of us uh, as we move through those relationships and behave ourselves in a more noble way, in a more advanced way and protect ourselves also, um, also period. 
So that's that's where I'm coming from. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's a personal uh, view I'm looking. I'm not as societal, I think, as Ken Wilber. I'm not looking at what's happening all all around. I'm looking. I'm interested in what's happening for Heidi and her life specifically, and what I'm struggling with. Yeah. At the end, I mean all these levels of development, they are expressing themselves in personal life, you know. <laughs> so, and uh, though it's, it's when we talk about us, I think it will be like an example for many other situations with other people or we ourselves have met before and probably will meet later. And what I appreciate that you are bringing in our own um, red energy uh, ecocentric energy. I want to add to that that so far in, in society it was for women not really allowed to express the red energy in the same way as men like anger and rage and um, you know like tantrum except when you are a child. But as an adult for women was um, sort of forbidden to show up in this way and so women normally took another way by manipulating others to express that their needs get first and are met first and um, and often also this caring for others uh, yeah women have this instinct I would say yes but sometimes it's sort of an over caring it becomes an overcaring, and that becomes then an expression of power on the other person. And this is the sort of uh, red energy, which mainly, yeah, also some men, but traditionally it's, it's the women's role in expressing their ego. While men are much more allowed to, you know, to fight <laughs> and to scream and whatever and to hit, which we, for us is not so the way. It's changing now too as we can also observe, but I just wanted to give that as an introduction. Yeah, I can tell you a little bit about me. I, I find myself in this stage that uh, I know in my past, the expression of anger was not really appreciated, but I had it often. And so I tried to shut down quite a lot in, in childhood, at, at least then in teenage years. And I got a sort of a bad conscience when I would express my dissatisfaction or my critique or my uh, anger on certain situations and try to endure. And this has brought me so many times in my life to situations where yet no, at the end it blows up. It goes like buff, you know, because it has taken too much to, to ferment, to come out, instead of saying at the beginning what's, what's so for me. It was my first marriage, for instance, where after a year I should have gone away. But you know, I was 20 and I thought, oh, what shall I do alone? And this man has money and blah, blah, blah. And so I, I stayed. And in many other cases, the, I had another husband, a German husband, before I, long before I met Mark. And he was so, I could, you know, let's say I'm attracted by people who are not looking, who are not normal, who are a little bit different. And there I often um, confuse um, pre-rational and post-rational people. I think they are already post-rational, but they are pre-rational and pre-rational is, for instance, the red stage. And so with my second husband, he was so sometimes I thought it's, it's impossible. He, I tried to talk with him and, and explain to him. He, for instance, as, just as an example, I went to earn the money. He was at home and he, for a while he cleaned the kitchen. And sometimes I turned home at 11 at night or so and wanted to eat something. And I just got out something out of the fridge, ate and left the the table on the, uh, the the plate on the table, and then he shouted on me that he has done everything so nicely, and I I would destroy his work, and um, and then he he doesn't feel like to be a cleaning woman, and he wants to be paid and stuff. And I said, "Hey, are you crazy? 
I mean, this is what women normally meet. They, they clean and then things get messed up and then, you know, and in this case, you are at home, I earn the money, can I expect? But it was no way to, to, to argue with him. And he was behaving very crazily, very often. And I, I began to think what he said, that I'm mad. Until I had um, internet, good internet. And I looked up the symptoms, what I saw with him. And I understood, oh, wow, borderline. <laughs> and that was the beginning that I finally got the idea that I have to separate. And I had endured too, too much. He was pushing me down and everything. But, you know, everybody else said, oh, he might have some problems, but he's such a nice guy and blah, blah, blah. And I needed a situation where I had a, a student, a singing student here for a week or so, and she was a psychiatrist. And she still also said, yeah, he has problems, but mm, yeah, and, and I have to be patient. I thought, how long do I have to have patience? Because it was really destroying me. And then one day he did the same sort of behavior towards her, which so far he had done only towards me. And she said, oh, yeah. And she understood that that was not normal and from her, from her book, you know, and she said, it's so different to have it as a work, uh, work with patients and have it directly right. thrown onto you. So that for me then was finally the um, decision to separate and to send him away because he was here. I had to send him away. And it took me a long time of enduring uh, crazy things, you know, really crazy things. I, I, I feared to come home at night and I asked people to accompany me home because he, he could have, you know, st stood around maybe with a, he drunk also with a knife or something. So it took me a long time until he finally realized that I'm sort of stronger and that he had to go. Not sure if I had sent him away right away after a year or so, if it would have been easier. But anyway, the insight is that this sort of craziness is expressing red energy by probably fearing. Because, I mean, borderline is a specific case. They have no real personality, you know, and they try to adopt personalities, try to, to fake to be somebody. And, um, but the expressions are very much like um, ego expressions you know, towards the other. It's not probably the ego, no, uh, in, in psychological terms, but the fear which makes them uh, um, work like this. Okay, this is, and the, it's not the only case. I had other people here and I always fall into the trap to somehow want to help to these people and uh, who, who seem to be need help or are victims or whatever. And then it turns against me. And I'm wondering, when do I want to learn that? Theoretically, I know that for a long time, but still I fall into the trap. And it was here with the uh, friends I have had here for half a year and sort of friends. Uh, now they, I don't think there are any more friends. And uh, they were here only for paying a minimum of consumption, energy, and things, use the huge area of the house, and made stories about when I asked money for the heating. And then I really exploded a little bit myself, writing, and I said, you know, normal social behavior would be, I even lent them my car, which I normally never do, because they came and said, oh, we buy a car, we, we rent a car, and they never did. And in the meantime, they took mine, and they took it for granted, and everything for granted. And I said, normal social behavior would be that you say thank you, and that you express it in some way. And I, I began to, to write about some situations, which I thought it was just in balance, you know. I would have expected that they offer me to help for that. I didn't ask for it. But, you know, maybe that's the problem, that I didn't uh, make uh, 
agreements for staying here, you have to work two hours a day or something, what I want to do. They did something, but what they wanted to do and displacing all my things in the, for the sake of beauty, um, but not asking me what I, I would like to have because my sense of beauty is inferior, you know, so, okay. <laughs> and uh, so at the end, she ran away, she came, gave me the keys and made something. And I said, what is that? And I said, you say you have, that we have exploited you and everything. I said, that's what you say. <laughs> you know, I said only that there was an imbalance and that I would have expected uh, at least a thank you. you know? So that was the outburst, which was before we met last time in the group conversation. And for a moment, it took my, really, I went into my, my kidneys. I didn't expect that, you know. For me, just stating how I would have liked uh, to, to have it go and especially not would have liked to make stories about the money. Who knows if I ever see it for the heating. So I've even paid for them, you know, and not only taken the risk that they ruin my car or something. And for me, I'm still hoping that people would be re re reciproc, how do you say? Re re reciprocal, reciprocal. Yeah, yeah. Reciprocal. Because or respect or generous. Yeah, or and, and, yeah and, and uh, at least understand uh, what they get and, and even say it sometimes or bring a flower or bring, yeah, once I got a flower and, and, and things, but you know, these little things which maintain friendship, as we say in German, you know, <laughs> kleine Geschenke erhalten die Freundschaft. So, and I would, that would have been okay, then I would, you know, that makes you um, available for, for this sort of, you know, that you give. And at the end, you know, they lived here for nothing in three. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, getting as a reward this outburst and probably I won't see the money, who knows. So I really thought, wow, why didn't I step up before? There were other things in, in, in the middle and, and so I don't want to go into details. But it was very clear that the way she, at least she is the boss, she's a victim. She's the boss in the family. And I see it uh, as, a, as a sort of a power struggle between her and me. She always tried to push a little bit more, you know, and um, in the victim position, they make you um, feel sort of guilty when you don't respond positively to the requests, you know. And this, I'm very, very aware of it for quite a time but still I don't go out in time from these situations because I had done a commitment. I had said, yeah, you can stay for half a year. So, Ooh, Heidi. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, the, for me it's interesting how to, how to handle these situations. But let me first ask you how your experience is and what you want to talk about. Um. I, I would prefer, Heidi, to respond to what you're saying because a lot of mine is the same. I'm in a difficult relationship uh, with an with a important relative. So it's not a choice for me. This person is, is a part of my family. And, and because we're recording this, I'm going to be very discreet. And um, the, she has her own issues and her own history and her own wounds and she just brings a complex to our relationship just as I bring my story and my my wounds and just as that woman brings hers and you bring yours you're talking about that now and it's been 10 years you know I can't walk away and so far she hasn't walked away so you know it's it's it it walking away doesn't seem like an option unless the whole family structure becomes destroyed and that's mm -hmm. very unlikely. So I have over the 10 years gone through many steps of accommodating this. 
And finally, I've turned to my guru, Tara Brach, in terms of um, some Buddhist thoughts. And the one that liberated me the most is by not paying attention so much to her flaws, you know, realizing, you know, who she is and becoming 100% responsible for my behavior in terms of protecting myself, honoring my instincts, um, delivering my messages in a, a compassionate way, but nonetheless strong way. And I don't think it's so much who we choose. I mean, I don't think it's so much once we're in it, there's not much we can do. But I think that when I hear you talk, it's not so much how do you get out of it. It seems like the question might be, how do you not let yourself get into it? You know, how can we know? See, with this person, I really have no choice because she's a member of my family. But in my own life, I'm very careful to look for red flags of selfishness or uh, unkindness or a neediness. You know, I really allow myself to be discriminating about who I let into my, my circle because I don't want my circle filled with uh, red energy if I'm able to, to anticipate it. Once it's there, then you know there's ways to deal with it, but it seems like our obligation to ourselves is to choose people or to choose no one, that's an op option too, that we feel we can really trust. And when I start getting signs that I can't, I don't postpone those, I, I pay attention to those and um, really move toward protecting my heart and my space. And the other thing that's so helpful to me when something like what happened to you happened, and many times something is happening right now to me that's very difficult, but the Buddha say that to think of all these things as in the service of uh, enhancing, expanding, our wisdom and our compassion. And so what I did with that yesterday, I went for a long walk and you know, I'm just realizing that the harder it gets, the more I'm forced to understand my role in it and how to take care of myself. And the compassion part was to listen to the pain I feel and honor that. And, you know, like a, like a loving parent or a loving partner would say, you know, you're really working hard at this. It's, you know, it's one of the most difficult things that, you know, you can't control everything. You know, you can't have everything you want. You know, I just kind of a, a, a support, a compassionate way of dealing with my struggle, you know, like you are with these people, what, well, what happened? And, you know, what's my part and what's their part? And that as you investigate that, it's with compassion for you, for, you know, how somehow we've let this, you know, into our lives as a, as a, as a lesson, as a, as a yoga to um, kind of unravel the knots of unclarity in us, you know, our, our own legacies, our own limitations. And, you know, Heidi, maybe you're working on welcoming more of your anger and that when someone, you know, does something you don't like, you don't blast red energy, but that you, you allow yourself all along the way to express it so that it doesn't accumulate into a bomb, you know? And so, learning to do that, you know, as a repressed German girl where, you know, you couldn't do that before, that's like a huge gift for you to have access, not only to your generous, loving, yes, oh, yes, I'll help you, yes, take my car, but also to have access to your no. You know, both yes and no are our birthright, 
but a lot of us got our no taken away. You know, don't you say that and you be nice girl and, you know, and I don't want to see that ugly face. You know, we, the no has been removed. And I think with wisdom and compassion, we can bring our no back in so that we can decide when we want to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, with your husband, you had to wait, um, you know, for so long before you finally said, no, this isn't how I want to live. I, you know, I'll leave a plate in the sink if, you know, all those, those, those parts of interacting that allow us to be ourselves. And so that's, that's the, I mean, my response is all to you because I really want to support your, um, your, your, your struggle, your awakening, awakening um, to how you want to let people in and out of your life. Yeah, uh, I, yes. Um, in this case, I said twice no and got almost then uh, put into tears because I got uh, blame for that, you know, or something or a psychological interpretation why I don't want, why I hold, uh, hold on to my car and things like that, you know, which is just not appropriate. And I, I, I was in this, here in this situation, I had a hard time the last year, so I was not really strong. The strange thing is since that finally has exploded, I feel relieved, completely oh. relieved. <clears throat> um, I, in the case of my borderline husband, it was difficult to say no, because I didn't know how. And, um, until I understood that it was an illness and not, you know, <clears throat> due to necessarily due to my uh, wrongdoing, uh, I didn't really know how to interact because I felt guilty. This is the guiltiness of, of uh, letting him alone, you know, in this. Uh, uh, for me, it seemed to be unable to, to really live in, in, in some way, you know. But this is all, these are all ideas which are probably, which I realize that the, who is playing the victim card is playing out towards the others to get them on the hook, you know, and not get them away. Now, what I'm struggling with is to understand this pattern and that I have repeated it so many times. I should finally be able to see that in time, you know. And I see what <clears throat> one of the reasons why this happens is um, a sort of, a, let's say a sort of a need, you know, because I have this big house and uh, when I'm alone, I would like to be somebody here to, to help me a little bit and things. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes great people show up. You cannot imagine how many people I had here in this house, uh, really uh, hundreds, you know, in, in 30 years. Some are really excellent and we can talk and we have an understanding and we come out and are happy. And some others, it's just like, like that, you know, it's like a, a request to take over ownership, you know. And uh, I had that too in the past, about 20 years ago, when I was uh, looking for somebody to, to be a partner with two, two women. Uh, came, not together, but in time, and both of them had similar attitudes. They wanted then to dominate me by changing the order in, in my wardrobes and whatever, you know. And yeah, the question is how to realize it, how to, I'm now in the situation that I really want to share the house and the beauty which is here, you know, with somebody who, who supports me then in, in exchange. And I think my error maybe is I let the people do and observe also to, to know if these people who arrive could be somebody I could live with, you know. And uh, so far, most of them, not all, but most of them I wouldn't want to be with because sooner or later these things come out. So I'm in, insecure about the strategy uh, which I'm doing, you know, or give the rules from the beginning. Yeah, then somebody uh, does the rules. We say in German, new brushes uh, clean well, you know, and then when, uh, when the time is uh, long enough, then the real 
person comes out. In this way, the real person comes out much earlier, you know, when I just let them go and see how much are you able to appreciate. They were still all the time complaining about this is not, and this is not, and this is not. You know, the f first people who ever had such a, a bunch of uh, complaints and with no appreciation for the actual beauty, you know. And so I see that people like this wouldn't be people to, to stay here, no? So what um, my present dilemma is how to find the right people to stay here with me and what way to find out what, let's say, what level of development or what, what willingness to, to be collaborative and respectful and communicative and uh, able to handle conflict because that was a, a three-year-old child, you know, tantrum, that, that, that's not a way to, to work through conflict, you know. So people like that, it's absolutely impossible to create a community, you know. So how to, how to find the right way to look for somebody and then to establish a, a community. I would like to have three, four people here to stay with, you know, and create something, something nice together. There can Heidi, be said. Hmm? I think that, are you, did you finish? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. I think that there is a way, I think that you're exactly looking at it right. I think there's two things. I'm sure there's a way to meet people and to uh, evaluate, not just kind of by your instincts or your first impressions, how you might fit together. Because in this country, there are planned communities and Bill's in touch with some of those people who live in Seattle and some, and they must have some kind of an intake process, a sensitive process that, you know, lays clear some of the basic tenets of who, you know, do you should have enough are you congruent and is it shared values and you know all of that I, I think a, a tool like that is essential and I believe they exist the other thing I keep thinking about as as a psychologist is that we the only way we can heal from our an early traumas indoctrinations lessons legacies all that we carry away from our home is to recreate the scene of the crime. So if part of your experience was living in an environment where you, you weren't listened to and you weren't able to express your nose and you, you know, where your power was, was my power, all of our powers were, were restricted or a woman that is in a domestic violence situation just keeps recreating another one and another one and another one and it's in the service of as an adult being able to stand up to it and finally clear our eyes and say enough you know so it's not unhealthy th that these that you keep repeating this pattern because only in this pattern the original pattern, the original crime of, you know, the murdered Mozart crime, mm -hmm. can we take a stand, not as a six-year-old or a nine-year-old or a 15-year-old, but, you know, as a grown woman who lives the examined life, finally we'll get it because those neural pathways are so deep. The patterns are so entrenched and you know, my thing that I'm dealing with, too, is my, my legacy of how important a grandmother is and how she deserves respect and, and, all, and, and that goes deep into my bones. That's a deep, deep belief. And I don't know if it's ego or what. It's everything. And that's not happening. So, you know, I'm having to retune that into the modern day of what my reality is. And I think we, we get to do that. And I think people who really are determined to learn the lessons and move beyond do do just what you know, you're know you doing of having it happen over and over again so that you can get a sense of what it is and then take 
take charge in a, you know, small ways. So taking charge in small ways would be to develop a tool of analysis where you can figure it out and have a trial period to see if both of you, you know, how you feel and keep talking about it and, you know, really have conversations and to really not allow anything to slip to really attend to each part of it, like a garden, that if, you know, weeds start growing over here, you know, we can't ignore those. We have to go look at them and, you know, understand them and, you know, do what we can. So I, I think that I imagine you having a house with as many lovely people as you want in it, not everything being smooth and perfect because we're human beings, but with the abilities, all of you, you know, to work through it beyond being a raging three-year-old or a frightened six-year-old that, you know, we kind of find mature people, find people at least equally mature as you are so that the work can be done because they'll be learning too. You know, if I could have, if this person that I'm struggling with had a desire and an insight and a willingness, I mean, wonderful things could happen, but I'm having to um, manage, you know, my angst and my pain by myself. And I'm able to do that because I'm being really compassionate with myself and staying wide awake you know and i can't go to sleep on the job you know i really have to be mindful and see when i go to the wound and then start burrowing down and all of a sudden the rabbit holes right there you know i'm barely holding and to you know to plant something or to look forward to a call from you or to take a run you know, i'm constantly having to uh, nurture by myself me and so when I took 100% responsibility for that and didn't expect really anything, 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 then I felt empowered. And I think that's what we do. You know, we, it's, it's up to us. It's, you know, it's our, it's our yoga. It's our life. Yeah, I have, uh, I'm an Enya uh, type four. So I'm easy in going in the victim position too and feel myself, you know, uh, um, sort of uh, deprived and everything like this, you know, and then I'm, I'm crying, let's say, not really crying, but, but I'm uh, in this position of, of the, the little child needing, needy. And um, this thing with the self-compassion, I'm not really too good in. I, I know sometimes I do, yeah, and I hold the child, but not I, I could be a little bit better in this, yeah. That's that's true. I could try that out. And still it makes a difference. You know, I grew up in a in a Germanic family too where compassion wasn't a big feature. And I just find if I find, you know, if you thought about Mark or if you thought about someone who really loves you, you know, what would they say to me at this moment? And they wouldn't say, You should do this and that's stupid that you're crying. They would say, you know, soft things. And it, yesterday it transformed me. I mean, I, I left the house devastated. I sat on the a hilltop and, and just sat there and I spoke kindness to myself. And it was as if my, my heart just opened up again because our hearts close when we, you know, have sore neck stuff and cruel stuff. But, you know, then you feel safe and you move on. So I, I can't encourage you enough to discover what might be a compassionate, nurturing, you know, and not looking in the mirror and saying, I love you. I hate all those modern things that people <laughs> do. But just having a quiet voice that speaks the truth. Like you would say to someone who was sad or someone who was confused or someone who was stuck, you know, just think the, that it just, I cannot tell you how much it helps me. So now I'm a huge advocate of self nurture and kindness and it, 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 it's very empowering. It's very freeing. Yeah. Thank you. The question I have for you is, do you, try to avoid them, this person. I often have them things of, you know, feeling of, oh, uh, I don't want to meet yeah. people like that anymore and try to. to I do. Yeah. No, if it were a person who wasn't as essential 
uh, in my family, I, I would stay forever away. I, I would, I, I'm forced to um, do this because of the position she has in my family. Um, and like, for instance, this, this weekend, anyway, yes. I think staying away is a very legitimate thing to do. You know, I think if there's no grounds for uh, work together or uh, I think it's, it's wasteful and it's painful and it's destructive to the self to hit up against a wall in such a painful way. I think, <coughs> yeah, yes. And yes, then stay, stay, what we need to stay away and send them away yeah. and you know i'm you know i'm sorry this isn't working for me you know i thought it might you'll have to go you'll yeah. have to go and we have to listen to the outrage and we have to listen to, you know, all that but that's not about me that's about their response to being told you need to go now so there are two other things in connection with that the one is um, always these are patterns that I often was um, sort of criticized to be bossy. And I tried not to be bossy, but try to be green, include everybody and share and blah, blah, blah. So uh, doing this, uh, I or whoever does a thing like this needs to be aware that there comes a whole avalanche of blame and of trying to shame you and trying to, to throw dirt on you when you you, E, I, in this case, uh, stand up and say no and, and be a boss and say, that's my house and you go, or that's my project or whatever it is. No? So the other part will always express, not always, when they are in the red energy, express their, their anger in a way which tries to diminish you and to, 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 to put you down and punish you for that. So one of the motivations not to speak up is certainly trying to avoid it, but the result is it always comes. I mean, sooner or later it comes, maybe even much worse, no? than when we did it in the, in the right moment, when the intuition says, oh, that's not, that's something off, you know? And um, yeah, and trust more in the intuition also. That's, that's um, in the own, perceptions. That's the other thing. I don't know if it happened. Probably it happened to you too as a German family uh, uh, child, let's say. Uh, in our family at least, they try to change your perception or ignore or, or when you perceived something and you said it, that they said it's not true. So that you... you, I you denied your perception. Yeah. They yeah. denied it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's then... Well, they, they passed on to us their own thinking errors, their archaic, narrow thinking errors. And I, I, I just think that, you know, to reclaim our permission, our, give ourselves permission to choose who we have in our life, if they're safe people, if they're developed to about the same level we are, I mean, that's that's our obligation, I think, to ourselves. In my case, I didn't choose this person, you know, so mm -hmm. it's very unusual that it happens to me because I'm also very opinionated and bossy. And, in, you know, to me, bossy is knowing what it is that you want. To me, bossy is being in touch with what your values are. You know, to me, bossy is you know, wanting to arrange the world in a way that it works for you. To me, it's, it, it's an ugly word. It's a, it has a negative connotation, but that's like many words, like she's a bitch, you know, and, and those words that anyone who doesn't want to see someone else's power, whose own power is intimidated, then, you know, calls it an ugly name, and then you feel like an ugly person. I just think that Heidi, making choices based on your wisdom, based on your desires, is what life is all about. I mean, I think that's one of the meanings of life, is that we choose a life, we create a life, we 
change our mind and do a different one, that that's our job as a human being. It's not just reading about philosophy and solving this. It's like staying focused in our own life to, um, to create it. You know, we're, yeah. we're like artists. And all, we got a lot of bad teachers. We got a lot of bad advice during the years growing up. And it's like, that's why we're so drawn together now as, as women. I mean, I was looking so forward to having this conversation because, you know, I knew what it was that you were struggling with. And I wish I could be more. And if sometimes we don't record it, I can be more open and that'll be more instructive for you too. Um, that you know i want more than anything to support you and i see sometimes you know your warm warmth that you shine through and then i see kind of your sadness i just go there's so much more that can illuminate and and lift you you know to the place where you really can be deserve to be want to be and will be it That's seems to me, yeah, that, that this is sort of the last right in, in closing childhood stuff, you know, so. <laughs> I don't know if it's ever done. I'm 77 years old and I continue. The question that someone asked, you know, how did my experience at home uh, influence me? My answer, I, I got it. And um, it, it shows me that it's still a deep influence on me. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. but like we're doing now, bringing it, it into the light, not having it be a secret or not having it be cloaked in, you know, in mystery makes a real big difference because then you know what you're dealing with. Yeah, exactly. Just like you do, you know, that... Um, Another thing... It, I, mm, excuse but, me. Another thing I wanted to mention, because you said uh, it is your life and do what you want, what your wishes are. This normally is considered egocentric. And actually, it's not really. Egocentric is the other thing, you know, that, uh, that me, 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 and everything you need to get, uh, even if it's not serving you. No? What, uh, what you are saying is, find out what is creating your life uh, as, as, how to say, not only beautiful, but uh, uh, satisfactory and, and wide and full as, as you can. And it's not that you have to have the, the latest version of uh, a cell phone or this or that and that. And I have to get something from you because you have it better. And you, you have more money, so you have to, to, uh, to, to give me and, and things like that. That, that would be uh, the egocentric state from, stage from, about which we were talking at the beginning. While you are talking about a healthy relationship to the own life and <clears throat> we come first in our own life it is like uh, like they say in the airplane when there is an emergency first put the mask on yourself and then on the others because when you put it first on your child in the meantime you you are dead and you cannot uh, serve the child anymore so we first need to be in in a good healthy position ourselves to be useful for others. And this has never been considered in the past. That has, when you do something for yourself, that's considered ego egoism. And I was always considered egocentric. Maybe I was, you know, but I want to say now, and also to say it for the, for the listeners, if you say, do something for you, make your life as good as possible, that's not red energy that is, healthy self-care. <laughs> it is. It's being responsible for the life we've been given. Heidi, who's a, whose life can we be responsible for? Could you have been responsible for these people that were there doing what they wanted in your house? No. You could just be responsible for how you would like the, the sanctity of your home space observed. You know that that to be responsible for it's an I think it is a new level of awareness that personal responsibility is really 
what we're here to learn because some people don't and they have such half-lived sad broken lives so to be you know ready to set up what we can that's that's healthy and giving to the others and maintaining our own sense of balance i mean yes it's about being responsible it's not being uh, egotistic I mean, to have a beautiful garden isn't egotistic. It's the joy of the growth and the, you know, or your home. So, so yes, exactly. I see your face lighten up when you <laughs> realize that. Yeah, I'm so glad. I just, um, I, I, it's permission to choose the life that we want and to share that with anyone and everyone like you have with these conversations, Heidi, it's such an amazing gift that we get to talk about these things together, that you sit there and, you know, figure out the technology mm -hmm. and think of the themes and write the beautiful, you know, you deserve that quality in your own personal life too. Absolutely, Heidi. I'm coming to live in Italy with you. Okay, good. <laughs> No, I actually had it with Mark, you know, to a huge dis uh, extent. I had a, a good life quality. And this situation, I think it is, it's a little bit like in nature when um, um, an animal is hurt, then it's more easy to be the prey for the predator, you know? You're vulnerable. You were yeah. vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. And I think I was in the situation where I, I would have needed some support, but instead, you know, I didn't get it. And I closed myself with trying to, to protect myself by not responding. I could, in I, my normal energy, I probably would have interfered in some way, you know, but I was not, definitely. So, but now I feel really, since this experience has been closed, if I get my money or not, that's the other thing. And it's really not much. <laughs> Well, and Heidi, sometimes you can think of actually sending them some more money, thanking them for making it so clear to you that this <laughs> will never happen to you again. I mean, I often do that. My, I had a horrible boss once, and my therapist said to me, every time she does something bad, she said, put a dollar in a jar, and when you finally quit, give her a huge bouquet and say, thank you for this, because I never would be where I am today if it weren't for you. I mean, you know, <laughs> turn it around. Turn it around. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I did, too. Okay, I will think about that. Anyway, thank you for this conversation because it's really enlightening me. I don't know if I, is the right word. Uh, my, I feel like uh, like flowering, like the you know, I, like uh, yeah. something like like more energy, more more um, more lightness, also you know. Yeah, see it in your face. See, that's what you must learn to give to yourself, too. Or we can talk whenever you want. I just feel a real desire to be as connected and helpful as I can and to be able to share my stuff a little more next time. But, okay. um, yeah, this, is, this, this was wonderful. I looked forward to it, and I'm so glad we did it. And the expression on your face is a, <laughs> a gift. To, I'm geschenk. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you.